coming up on episode 179 of Creative Writing. I'm talking about how to stop wasting time and money on book launches. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. These restless thoughts have kept me up again tonight. Hello and welcome to Create If Writing. This is the podcast for you, an author who wants to sell more books without being smarmy. And I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant. I am so happy that you are listening to the podcast today and I'm really excited about what I'm going to be talking about, book launches, not wasting time and money, which follows quickly on the heels of episode 178 on productivity where I talk about how to not waste time and money while you're writing. This is kind of a natural overflow of how to stop wasting some time on your book launches and your marketing efforts. Yay! Now, if you want the show notes to this, you can go to creativewriting.com slash 179 and you will find them there. And I'm kind of laughing because I'm afraid... I don't know. I'm Sometimes I get a little afraid I'm going to get a little flack for the episodes. And this is one where I feel that way. And here's why. So I'm going to start with this giant caveat. We're just jumping right in, okay? Jumping right into uh, the content here. Uh, I'm also in a huge hurry because my husband needs to renovate the bathroom (laughs) that's like connected to the office I'm in. So I'm going to do my best not to talk fast, but we're not wasting a lot of time this week. Um, So here's why I'm a little afraid, because I bet a lot of you have done some of the things that I'm going to say are a waste of time. And I know, like, I am very sensitive to criticism as much as I, I think, put out a tough exterior. I internalize it all and beat myself up. So just, first of all, if you've done any of these things, I am not judging you. And also, maybe they worked for you, okay? I am basing the things I'm telling you on today on the book launches I've done. I've launched now, I think, 15 books um, in various genres. And I also talk talk, 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 talk all the time to authors who are successful and authors who have struggled. And I also am a nerd and observer and watch in Facebook groups to kind of hear what people are saying. So whenever someone brings up a topic of book launches or a particular strategy, I bookmark it. And then I go through and read what the different people have said about them. And then I kind of go and say, okay, well, this person said this. What do their books look like? Like, are they, is this someone who... I should listen to or not. So I I do a lot of digging. So these are a a lot of anecdotal things. I am not a researcher. I am not a data person. I have not collected a survey and then, you know, double check to make sure people didn't lie on it about their book launches. But this is the best that I can give you for what is working now, what isn't working now. And it also varies by genre. So some of the stuff, um, and I'll kind of give some examples, but some of the things in here that I'm going to say that waste time, um, maybe these are actually like the very best things that you should be doing. So take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, don't be offended if you've done one of these things. And please tell me if you did it and it worked for you. I'm not going to change the whole podcast because I do feel like even if this worked for a few people, from my experience and the observations that I've made um, and the people I've polled about this, these are overall things that do waste time, even if they work for a few. So hearing you say that, I'm happy to know because maybe somebody out there wants to try that method, um, but I'm not, I I do stand firm (laughs) by these things, but they have a big caveat, okay? That's my big caveat um, because it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say sweeping across a bunch of genres what could work or not work, and it can change all the time. You know, I, I hear from people all the time who are saying, well, this just worked for me five years ago and it doesn't work now, or I've seen the market change in the past two years since I've been in here. So things change all the time. This is just some things that I see people wasting time and money on. That's the end of the caveat. Now I'm going to very strongly suggest that you avoid (laughs) some of these things that I'm going to suggest. And again, if you have done them, don't think that I'm calling you out or judging you. Also, if they worked for you, keep on doing them. And just because I say they don't work, I mean, ignore me if they're working for you. Absolutely, because repeat it with me, we should all do what works for you, right? Do what works for you, not what someone else, whether it's on this podcast or another one, says that you have to do. So these are just, they're suggestions, strongly worded suggestions, <laughs> but suggestions nonetheless. So we're gonna start with the first thing, um, to stop wasting money. So how to stop wasting money, how to stop wasting money on your, and time on your book launches. And the first thing is, um, 
If you want to stop wasting money, then make sure you have a professional genre appropriate cover and a good blurb. And you're kind of like, wait, haven't we heard this before? Or why are you starting here? Well, I'm starting here because I so often see people talk about struggling to sell books and then they share a link and you go and look and their cover is atrocious um, or it's not a bad cover, but it does not convey anything. Like maybe it's pretty, but I'm like, I don't know what genre this is. I have no idea. Um, And if I don't know, and I'm a nerd who's always on Amazon researching genres, chances are the person who is reading the genre that's intended for is not going to recognize the visual signals that the book puts out. Because let's let's be honest, that is what your book cover is about. It is the sending a visual signal to the right reader that they should buy that book. That's what the book cover is for. Not to be pretty, not because you like it. It needs to send the visual signals that are sometimes even subconscious that are attracting the right reader to the book. People don't think of book covers this way. And so often I will, you know, the first problem that people have is they launch a book that doesn't have the right cover and that doesn't have a good blurb. And so you have to start here because you are going to waste time and you are going to waste money if you launch a book that does not have a solid color cover and blurb. Um, I put blurb secondary because if people can't get past your cover, likely they will not um, get past the blurb. But the best book that I have read on, um, on, I guess just the blurb on Amazon specifically, but, but this also translates to other places, Mastering, oh wait, no, it's not that one. Hang on. Oh yeah, it is Mastering Amazon Descriptions by Brian D. Meeks. That is my favorite book and I went and read it. I looked at the examples and I continue to work on this. I'm not amazing at it, but it's something I'm continuing to work on and I've seen myself get better. But if you're looking, look for Mastering Amazon Descriptions and that will help you with your blurbs. But you can also go read different blurbs that are successful from, I feel like the covers and blurbs look in your genre because I do, I got to hear Brian Meeks speak and he has some very specific thoughts about how blurbs work. And he is someone who's more data driven, uh, but I didn't always necessarily agree. So like a lot of genres are very much into first person blurbs, but he says, ignore that and do third person because they sell better. Um, But he also admitted that he may not know every genre. So you do need to look at what works. And I think both can work well, Um, but look in your genre, look at what's selling and then base your covers and your blurbs on those and get some feedback. Um, not just random feedback, <laughs> get some feedback, hopefully from, you know, groups that are are solid and have authors that know what they're talking about or are related to your genre or even reader groups um, for your genre before you go ahead with a cover or blur, but especially the cover. So that's the first way you can stop wasting money is to make sure your cover is genre appropriate and professionally done or looks professional. If you are a designer, I know some people who make great book covers or who have trained themselves to, and that's fantastic. If graphic design isn't your thing, stick to writing and hire out that cover. Another way to stop wasting money is to pay PR firms and paid book launchers. Now here's one that I think might get me some flack as well, especially if you're coming from the traditional world, because I do know a lot of people who, um, and indies even too, who have hired PR firms or who have hired a book launch person. Now here, here is kind of why I think this is very attractive. I think this is very attractive because we don't want to do the marketing. And um, for a lot of us who have maybe come from a traditional background, which I would include myself in there, when you see what people are doing from the traditional world, it seems like in some way, I think it makes us feel a little bit more legitimate as indie self-publishing authors to do something like that. Um, that sounds more measurable. Like when I tell my husband, oh, I had a PR firm. That sounds way cooler than I spent a bunch of time researching on Amazon to find, find where my book fits the best. But that second part might actually work better for you than hiring a PR firm. Um, I'm not saying they can't work. However, I've talked to a number of authors who have found trouble quantifying and measuring the results they got. They got exposure, but in terms of book sales, which brings me to a point, um, let me pause and give you this point that I should have mentioned in the very, very beginning. And that point is how are we measuring the success part? This is so important. I have it in the in the blog post. I wrote the blog post first, but then I kind of scrolled away and wasn't reading. Um, we're measuring success in this episode based on book sales. 
bottom line, because when you're launching a book, you can have different goals. And I've had some book launches that weren't just about sales, but the very basic success of a book launch is on sales. And your sales numbers, like for your launch and what's successful, might be completely different than mine. So we're not talking specific numbers, but a successful book launch sells books to the right reader. So if you're not seeing sales, this is what we're measuring. We're not measuring it on, um, I felt happy about it, or um, although you wanna be happy about it, um, but we're not measuring it on, I saw a lot of Instagrammers sharing my book. That is really cool, it's really cool. Um, did it translate to book sales? So that's what I'm gonna keep coming back to and how I'm measuring this. So, okay, thinking about the PR firm, um, the people that I've known who have hired book launch kind of teams, because there are some services out there, a lot of them are super sketchy and scammy. So it makes it hard to know the legitimate ones, I think, unless you have someone you trust really recommend them. But a lot of people who are using this whole PR firm or doing some kind of big blast online, there's nothing measurable other than seeing a lot of people share your book. Super cool, super, super cool to see a lot of bloggers, Instagrammers, booktubers, all of these different people sharing your book. But if it doesn't translate to sales, then I have to ask, where's the success? Where's the ROI? Where's the return on your investment to this company? Because these companies can be outrageously expensive. Um, and I've seen even just this week, I was looking at a couple services to help you get your book into the world for thousands of dollars. And I will tell you as an indie, um, it can take a while to earn a thousands of dollars, especially when your price point is like $2.99. And so when you're paying a company or when you're giving up a ton of royalties to let them market for you, um, you know, you just have to ask yourself, okay, so how many, how many do I have to sell to like actually get some money here? What, what are they going to do for me? Um, and is it going to translate to book sales? Um, and for a lot of them, you know, there are some services again, that might be helpful. We want to do that because we don't want to market ourselves. Um, but I want to tell you, it doesn't have to be, especially if we're just thinking, okay, I just need to make book sales. Just, I say that like it's easy. It's not easy necessarily to make book sales, but it doesn't have to be complicated. It, I think we overcomplicate this process. We feel like we have to have all of these balls in the air and I will get to at the end and point you to some other resources to have a simple book launch. PR companies can get the word out. They can get you exposure in exchange for your money. Exposure doesn't always translate to sales. And I have not heard a lot of... Um, stories from the authors that I have spoken to about PR companies or about book launch firms where there has actually been a lot of sales. I've seen a lot of exposure, a lot of talk of, um, you know, brand, brand recognition or getting the word out about the book. But if the word doesn't translate to sales, then I am not going to consider that necessarily something that should be high on your priority list. Maybe I'll say it this way. <laughs> you can do it, but maybe it shouldn't be high on your priority list. And because these are expensive, I would recommend maybe avoiding them. Number three, how to stop wasting money on your book launch and time um, is blog tours. And this can relate to the PR and book services because sometimes the PR companies will do this for you or set it up for you. Sometimes the services will, or sometimes you can just pay for a blog tour. I do know some people who have tried to organize them themselves, which you're not costing uh, money. Although some of these bloggers now will only work with PR firms or firms that set these up. You will waste your time um, trying to coordinate all of this if you're doing it yourself. So what is a blog tour if you're not sure? It basically is getting a whole lot of different bloggers who talk about books, um, hopefully in your genre, if you're going to do this at all, um, to post about your book and to post at a specific time to kind of help um, get the word out about your book. So I've talked to a lot of authors when before I was kind of on the scene publishing fiction this did work really well for a lot of genres and a lot of authors. Um, categorically, I see over and over and over again across most genres that this is not really translating into sales. And I'm even talking, I've talked to, um, I have some friends who do traditional deals, um, have book, traditional book deals, and they have talked about um, the fact that they had bloggers who, um, you know, their, their publishing company even paid to send them gift baskets, like expensive gift baskets, and then the blogger just like copied and pasted the PR pitch, like the basically the blurb that was sent on their blog. They didn't review the book. Um, they didn't necessarily talk personally about it. They just kind of copied and pasted what was sent. And then all this money was spent and all this time. So I, I don't see a lot of that. And I think there's some reasons for this. One is that I would call that lazy. I mean, I just, I can't fathom 
as someone who used to blog kind of full time, like I cannot fathom doing that to somebody, doing that to an author where you're just copying and pasting and that, and that is kind of normal. And I've seen that. I've seen multiple posts where it's normal. I've also seen some amazing book bloggers who go way out of their way. In fact, I want to give a really quick shout out and I'll see if I can find her um, link really fast, but there is a reader for my YA under Sullivan Gray named Kristen, and she has just an epic, epic, I'm trying to find her blog name here so I can share it with you guys. Um, oh, maybe I'm not going to be able to find it right now. Oh, here it is. Okay, so her blog name is read, ramble, repeat. Um, let me see if it's just .com. Read, ramble, repeat, dot home, dot blog. So read, ramble, repeat, and Kristen. She has done um, some reviews. I've given her some advanced copies. She has done some reviews. She writes the best reviews full of gifts and emotion and personal things that are fantastic. Does it translate to book sales? I don't know because I, here's the thing with Amazon. They really don't, they can be kind of anti-tracking link and, and they're, if you're using a paid service like reader links and universal book links, there's ways to track it. It gets complicated. Um, I'm not paying her. She just likes the books. And so I don't have tracking links on her site. She's probably using her own affiliate links on her site if she's smart. And so um, I don't know, but I know that I love those reviews. So there are some great book bloggers out there who are doing this, but does it translate to sales? I, I don't know. Um, and especially for the time you're taking to do it. Categorically, again, I hear from authors in multiple genres saying that this does not translate to sales, that it used to, but it doesn't. Another reason, um, besides bloggers kind of like just sliding them in there sometimes, unlike amazing people like Kristen, is that a lot more people are not taking the time to read blogs the way they used to. They're on Instagram, they're on Facebook stories, they are on Snapchat and TikTok and all of these other places, they're not necessarily taking the time to read a blog post. Maybe they're listening to podcasts. Um, it's not to say blogging's dead because it isn't, but I do think blogging has shifted. And I think that that shift has impacted the success of blog tours um, just as much as I think that um, some of the people that did these kinds of book blogging kind of got a little bit uh, happy and content and stopped working so hard. Um, but my question is, if you're purchasing a blog tour or something like that, what else could you have purchased with that money? How many ads could you have run um, that were effective with, with that money? So um, blog tours tend to be, tend to be a waste of your time and money because they're not going to translate typically to a lot of book sales. I feel like, again, I keep having to put these caveats in there because it might, I think if you're an Arrested Development fan, I'm just thinking of Tobias going, but it might work for us. Um, shout out to all my Arrested Development fans out there. So number four, um, something that is wasting your time, probably not your money, uh, hopefully not your money, it should not waste your money, but your time, uh, Facebook parties. Now, you guys know if you've been around that I love Facebook groups. I love me a good Facebook group. I will not tell you how many groups I am an admin of except that the number is double digits and it is maybe upwards of 50. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> I love Facebook groups. However, um, Facebook groups, I, I will say two things about them. They're less effective as readers um, or to sell books, less, less effective um, to have reader groups as they you know, were maybe a few years ago. And they tend to be more effective in certain genres. Um, so I will tell you certain subsets of romance. I'm in, I'm in a whole lot of Facebook groups just to kind of observe. And I will say some subsets of romance do really, really, really well and have amazing reader groups that sell books just organically, like readers recommending other readers' books, not even authors using the groups, but readers recommending readers' books and people going and buying them. There are those. Um, they don't always happen across genres. So I will say in clean romance, these Facebook groups are less effective. Um, and also because Facebook groups have become so popular and so many authors are having bad behavior and going and spamming all these groups. I'm in one group for Christian readership that has like, you know, 10,000 people. So it has, and it's active. There's, it's a community. It's not just people dropping links like a link graveyard, but likely because of bad behavior, they have become so strict that everything is really, um, I don't know, just so regulated that it almost kind of kills the ability for an author to use it. Example, they only let posting happen at a certain time. Um, 
and I posted a link at that time, but they didn't like how many people commented on it, so they shut the comments down. I was like, well, okay then. <laughs> Way to stifle a conversation that was happening organically about my book that I posted at the correct time. Um, Facebook groups can absolutely work well. These parties, I, I feel like they, you know how it is. People just kind of get tired. Like once you've been to one of these, you've been to them all, right? Um, they can still be effective. I have tried them both in clean romance and in the young adult and have found varying degrees of success, but mostly a handful of copies being sold. Now, if you're not sure what these are, they look like a lot of different things. There's takeovers where, you know, maybe you get to post on a specific day. They introduce you as the author taking over for the day and you have, you know, anywhere from three to 10 posts. It, it really varies by group, but you have a couple posts that are meant to be engaging, maybe games or giveaways, getting people excited, sharing your book links. Um, there are also bigger parties where I've seen people bring in other authors like celebrity guests, making actually an event, like going into the group and you can create an event within your group and doing things that way and making it like really official, giving it a party atmosphere. Um, all those things are fun. I mean, you know, when you're launching a book, um, and I could talk about this maybe in another episode, but you know, you want to build excitement. Um, and, and that does help translate to book sales, getting people excited about your book and having them come along the journey with you. Um, that's not necessarily a direct sales thing, but that's, that's the way we should be launching a book is with this excitement. These parties can do that. I still do them, even though they're not incredibly effective, but I think it's just important. I mean, it's a free way of marketing, right? Um, you're not paying to go do this. I think I've seen a rare occasion where there's something like this that's paid. And I would just recommend not doing that if you ever run across that. Um, but there are some free opportunities like this. And again, just consider it free marketing, kind of like a newsletter swap. Newsletter swaps can be effective. They can also not do much at all, but it's a free tool. Just know that you don't want to necessarily rely on this unless you're in a niche where these work super well. And I do know a few authors who said they launched a book and had great sales only using Facebook groups and parties. Um, so they absolutely can work well. I wouldn't say don't do them. I would just say give them um, give them the amount of time that they're due. <laughs> like as in um, don't spend hours creating creative graphics. And I've got some examples of graphics in the show notes that I have created, um, creativewriting.com slash 179 for episode 179. You can find some of those graphics in there. And I use those. So I, I did take some time to create them. But once I created one, I could create them for different genres. You'll see kind of I went in Canva and then you just copy and paste um, with the graphics and you can change things out. Um, so it didn't actually take that long. And then I used them in multiple groups. With the young adult, I did find more success doing um, being active and doing takeovers in a specific Facebook group. Like when I launched the Academy series um, with my co-author EC Farrell, we did a lot in a specific Academy Facebook group. And it wasn't a huge group, but it was very active because people wanted to read Academy books. And we got up, I would say most of the pre-orders we got, we ended up with like, a, I think a little over 100 pre-orders for our book, which is, I mean, I was really happy that first, first time for both of us publishing really under that pen name, those pen names. And most of that came from that specific Facebook group over about a month's time. So not just like one party, but a month's time. Um, with the clean romance, I've kind of tracked some of the parties or takeovers I've done. And, you know, you can't really track um, KU borrows, like if you're in Kindle Unlimited, but you can watch your rank. So I've watched my rank in sales. And I would say, you know, a part of your takeover for the most part, like five to 10 sales, like not a lot. Okay. So it's something, this can be a part of your strategy, but if you're spending all of your time trying to set these up and create graphics and all that, or just spending, you know, I was in one where it was like a whole day. I was supposed to post over a whole day and they didn't make me an admin, which meant you had to actually show up live to do it. And they wanted you to interact. I mean, I felt like I wasted a day. Um, I could do other things in between, but I felt like I kept having to come back to that. So don't get caught up um, in that. And if you're doing these, like see if you can become an admin for the day, even just so you can schedule posts and then come and comment because it really is if it's a very long period of time, these can really be a big time suck specifically. So maybe they're part of your strategy, but if you're trying to cut back where you're wasting time and money, Facebook group parties and takeovers um, can take up a lot of time and they don't always have the best sales. The fifth and final thing I'm going to say to stop doing is really like very vague <laughs> and it's kind of a cop out, but I want you to stop doing anything that sounds fun or cool 
or is what people do that doesn't translate to, say it with me, sales. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what this is for you. I see lots of different things over across different genres or things that people are doing. Um, and sometimes I'll ask if it's an author, I know like, Hey, did that like do anything for you? Like, did your rank go up? Did you get any pre-orders? And, um, often the answer is no. Um, so here are a couple of the questions that I ask. I mean, but, but really like if you've already launched a book, look back, what did you do, um, to launch the book? Did it, actually translate to sales as much as you can tell. Um, and when if you're launching a book, do the best you can. And if you can't track the sales because of, you know, Amazon tracking links or what, whatever the reason, um, look at your ranking for the day and kind of, you know, estimate like, okay, did it move? Like if it didn't move, <laughs> you know, that's telling you something. Maybe that's wasting money for you. Okay. So, um, just got some questions here, like some ideas like, okay, so cover reveals. This is something that a lot of people do. And again, not to knock it because I know you're out there and you have done a cover reveal. Um, I am not saying don't do them. I think this can be a great way to build the excitement. But I would say for any of these kinds of things, if it's something that's not necessarily going to translate to sales, just make sure you're not spending a lot of time on the graphics. Like I've seen Um, people buy cover reveal videos. I've seen people buy like multiple graphics where each week something else is revealed. If you're making that yourself and it doesn't take a lot of time, awesome. Um, As a reader, like especially like cover reveals tend to excite the fans you already have. Chances are they've already pre-ordered your book. I mean, like when I'm a fan of somebody, if I'm going to pre-order their book, I don't need a cover reveal to get me there. Like I I just like their books and I'm going to buy it. So um, just be aware of the time you're giving to something is a cover reveal actually translating in to sales. So don't spend a lot of time. Don't spend a lot of money. Um, podcast interviews. I mentioned this, I think in last week's episode about productivity, but, uh, one of my clean romance books under Emma St. Clair got a shout out on a pretty big podcast. And I had a whole bunch of people email me like, I heard about, I heard your book, your book was mentioned on there. And, you know, they know me well enough to know it was my pen name. But it was a podcast for writers, not for clean romance readers. And so a whole lot of people emailed me and that was super cool. I did not see sales, maybe a couple. Um, In the same way, I have a a friend who was on a very massive, massive podcast. And, uh, but it was not necessarily, I mean, the podcast that's a little bit, you know, maybe not tailored to, she was nonfiction, but not tailored necessarily to her audience. It should have been a great fit, a great crossover. Um, and I was like, well, how did it go? And she's like, well, I got some Instagram followers. Uh, but as far as she could tell, she didn't sell any books. Um, Instagram followers may turn into book sales, but you know, maybe not. <laughs> and so um, just keep in mind, unless you're doing nonfiction, which nonfiction can can be really fantastic, especially if it's like a how-to and you're on a book, uh, I'm sorry, on a podcast for the people who are like your specific people. So for me, as I'm, you know, I'm about to relaunch my email podcast or email book. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm about to relaunch my email book for authors. I could go on author podcasts and I might do that. Um, although my time is killing me. If I had time, that would be a fantastic thing is it's for authors. I could go on podcasts for authors and that might actually be, have some great ROI. Um, other kinds of podcasts, if they're not built for your specific readers, that may not be the best use of your time. Um, I've seen people do series on their blogs, uh, sample chapters or behind the scenes. Again, this that could be great, but the people who are reading your blog are people who already know you. Like no one's going to be on Google searching for how Emma St. Clair wrote her book behind the scenes. Like the, no one's going to discover me that way. So like chances are the kinds of people who are reading those posts are the kinds of people who either pre-ordered or are reading in KU and they're waiting for that exact launch day to go click read now on KU. Um, I don't need to give them a blog post to get them to do that. They're already there. Yeah, and here's another last one just to kind of consider. And again, these are not exhaustive and hey, they might work for you. But just what I want really is for you to just be cautious and to ask yourself if these things are wasting time and money. If they're not, keep doing them. If they are, then just let it go and don't feel guilty. But the last one is, um, trying to get your friends and family excited. Now, I will say that for my first couple of book launches, so I had a nonfiction devotional book, um, and family was integral in that. They really were. Um, and, you know, in my first clean romance and the short story, I think I relied a lot more. I mean, I was just excited. I mean, some of it was not like, okay, my book launch plan. I didn't have a plan. I just like did some stuff. <laughs> but my, I'm, oh, I did actually for the clean romance, I had a plan, but I was just really excited. And so I was sharing that excitement. Um, with friends and family. And I did have a lot of them 
uh, you know, they were supported. They shared it with friends. They, you know, were really engaged. They told other people. But typically, unless your family and friends are your ideal audience, which chances are there's a handful, but they're not all your ideal audience, unless they are, after your very first book, when they all want to cheer you on and support you, and caveat, some will not support you. That's okay. Um, Other than that, you're not going to have a ton of support from your friends and family. Um, Susie in our Facebook group, and I'll get the name of her, um, her book, but she was sharing that. I hope it's okay to put this on here. I should have asked you, Susie. Her book, Purple Socks and Peppermint Tea, A Christmas Clean Romance, came out this past Christmas. And her mom was a huge proponent and like sold tons of books just because she was excited and loved Susie. And we don't all have those people in our lives. If you have them, they're likely going to do that for your first book. But you don't want to... Um, annoy them. And you also don't want to depend on friends and family. But again, like being excited about it, telling them about it, that's fine. But just realize that's not necessarily a great strategy. So I've been really negative, right? Lots of things that you may have done that you may be mad at me about now for saying don't do. Um, Or maybe they already wasted your time. And you're like, yep, that was a big waste of time. What do you need to launch a book? What do you really need to do what I said, which is to sell books? That's kind of the point, right? And really, what you need is you need to get your book in front of people who read and buy books in your genre. That's it. Get your book in front of people who write, read. Why do I keep saying ride? Read and buy books. They're not writing books. They're reading and buying books in your genre. Easier said than done, right? Um, but if I had to really pare down what this looks like and what I do for my launches, it is really pretty simple. And it has to be because I'm launching like a book a month, okay? So this has to be simple. I cannot do this giant fanfare for every single launch. And yet I'm still selling books. So how am I doing that? First, I'm writing a good book. You need to write a good book with a solid cover for your genre and a good blurb. That's the start. Um, Building an email list. I will never say too much about email lists. So you have some readers prepared. Um, I run sales and then I pay the newsletter companies like e-reader news today. I haven't gotten a book bub yet. The big paid book bub, um, not book bub ads, but the book bub, book bub feature deals. Um, Robin reads those kinds of companies, book cave. Um, I have success with those. I do those swapping with other authors in my genre. So doing newsletter swaps, that's free promotion. It has some impact, not enormous, but it does sell books and then paying for ads on Facebook and Amazon. I've dedicated time to learning those. And that's kind of, um, a step above, like as you grow, that's definitely something to invest some time and, and money in actually is um, you might be better served not paying the PR company and buying a Facebook ads course (laughs) from someone who is an author selling maybe even in your genre, which I've gotten that specific. Um, And then something else I I do, but kind of comes last is sharing in relevant Facebook groups or maybe doing a party, but that doesn't, I don't spend a lot of time um, to do that. And then I repeat, I write a new book and I do the same thing, Um, or I continue to do those things for my back list of books. That's a lot simpler, right, than doing a whole lot of little pieces here and there. And that does, I will tell you, those things sell books. It's the very bare bones basics. And I do have a whole series that I did on simple book launches, from a simple book launch framework to um, getting other people to share your books using paid promotion and building your list. And then I have a post on book launch disasters. And I'm sharing all of those in the show notes at creativewriting.com slash 179. And if you really want a deeper dive into this, I'm doing a live training, a paid training on March 18th at 8 p.m. Um, on book launch strategies. I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to give you lots of resources. And hopefully you will leave feeling confident about your book launch. And, and not it's not just for one specific kind. It's not just for sweet romance. I'm going to talk about how to create and tailor your perfect book launch for you in this two-hour um, workshop that I'm having. So you can find out more about that in the show notes, but also you can go to creativewriting.com slash workshop. If you're listening in the future, hello future, um, there will be a replay available at creativewriting.com slash workshop available for purchase. So these are, this is a paid workshop that I'm doing going more in depth um, as you would expect with something that is paid. Uh, but if you're not in the position where a paid workshop, they are very affordable. If you're not in the position, you can pay for that. There's some great free resources on the website. The whole point of this is I don't want you wasting your time. I don't want you wasting your money. I wanted you to be productive last week in episode 178. I want you now to stop wasting time and money when you're launching your book and also stop being 
um, scammed and paying a lot of money you don't need to pay to other services that really don't do that much for you. Don't do it. I want to help you. And if you find things that are working for you, even if they're things I said, don't do it, um, then keep doing them if they're working for you, by golly. Uh, but make sure you actually have a standard of measuring this and that you're actually making sales. That's a really important thing. You want that ROI, the return on the investment of your time and money. All right, so I'll be waiting for your comments where you yell at me and tell me that your cover reveals are the best and your Facebook parties are the best. And I will humbly say I'm so happy for you. Um, but I will also stand by the fact that um, these are things I've shared that I think will save you time and money if you stop doing them. Thank you guys so much for listening and putting up with me and, and my ranty episodes. Um, I feel like I've had a couple of these lately, but in any case, I hope they're helping you. That's the goal. Um, if you want to sign up for my weekly emails to get tips, resources, and more, you can go to createifwriting.com slash quick fix. You can also join our free Facebook community, which I am biased and think is the best place on the internet. Um, but a lot of you guys think that too. So you can go to createifwriting.com slash community, and that will take you right to the Facebook group. Thank you so much to Jasmine Commerce of jasminecommercemusic.com for the tunes on the show. And again, I'd really want you guys, these workshops that I'm doing this year, I think that they're incredibly valuable. And actually, <laughs> I've been told that I'm charging way too little for them. So please go check that out at creativewriting.com slash workshop. If you are planning to launch a book, get the workshop, come show up live and get the replay and the resources for that. Now it's time for you to go out and create content that you love and serve your people well. I